everyone and welcome to episode number 45 of the friday nightmares podcast on this episode we are going to be talking about body horror and no i'm not talking about what it looks like when i take my shirt off but <laughs> oh don't be like that scotty <laughs> no i just had to say it no we're potty positivity on this podcast I know, <laughs> but anyways, I just had to throw that silly joke out there. I am one half the hosting team this evening, Mr. Smoke Show Crawford, coming to you from the town of Swartz Creek in the county of Genesee, in the state of Michigan, in the United States of America, in the North American continent, in the Western Hemisphere, on the planet Earth, in the Milky Way galaxy, fully vaxxed, waxed, ready to climax, and if you can please get me wet and feed me after midnight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and scotty's been fed a lot after midnight recently and with him is his hostess with the mostest yeah Pal <laughs> coming to you from Waterdown, ontario canada and i can say i've seen scott with his shirt off he looks good oh he you. has a nice body he definitely does Not that body there's a reason why you were the smoke show scott like you got broad big shoulders you got nice arms you know, besides like in Gremlins, honestly, you're like a 10 out of 10. Like oh, it, you. The Gremlins just brings you down by a decimal point. That's it. Everything else is just 10 out of 10 out of 10 out of 10 out of 10. So I'm a 9.9 .9 with loving Gremlins? That is right. But you know what you are? You're my number one 2021 of the year. That's, that's what you are. My number one <laughs> 2021 movie is Scott Crawford. Um yeah. Man, Scotty, I feel like we've done a lot. It, it, Halloween's done. We're recording this in November. Halloween is done. Uh, but it was one heck of a October. It was an enjoyable time. Yeah, I'll say we ended up like, it feels like we haven't recorded like in a while. But like, I, you know, we did actually just a couple weeks back. But <laughs> it just feels like so much has happened in that small amount of time. <laughs> so, so much has happened, Scott. That is, that is very true. Um, I went to the Frightmares convention, uh, last week, which was yeah. great shit. Like it was way better than the one that was there four years ago. <laughs> uh, it was very large in comparison. They had, uh, some stars there. Felissa Rose, of course, had a very long line, always does. Oh, yeah. Um, there was some great distributors there for different films. Vinegar, Vinegar Syndrome was there. Nice. Uh, some really cool special effects stuff, some great vendors. I bought a mask. I got one of my uh, little it pen, one of the little um, Funko Pop pens, only with uh, Pennywise on it, which was pretty awesome. And yeah, I was I was impressed. I was there for about an hour and a half. And my friend, she went to the Fan Comic Con Expo that was right next door. So it was worth the trip to Niagara. I got partied pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> that night uh, i went to a club and i dressed up as uh one of the characters from rocky horror picture show i did share pictures to the page thank you everyone for your kind comments uh, yeah, that was a badass costume thank you yeah I, everyone got it at the bar the only two people that didn't get it and and scott knows who they are is amber and ann both oh, thought yeah. i was black swan <laughs> but everyone well, I mean else I got it right, but I don't think her makeup's that light. But I I couldn't remember no. what Black Swan. No, I think like. she has like silver around her eyes that goes yeah. down a bit. Right. So I uh, I uh, but other people did waiting in line at the bar, waiting in line at the washroom, on the dance floor. People got that I who I was. Uh, we were there till about quarter to two in the morning. And then came home and smoked a fatty, and I was up till three a.m. So I felt it for like two days. Two days afterwards, <laughs> yeah. I felt it. 
And then I was like, okay, I was saying to my people, we got to rest because Scott's coming up in two months. And we need everything. Like, you need to get that energy for when Smoke Show shows back up. Party well, sense, baby. there'll probably be some parties in December, but nothing like going out to this club. It was right. just, you know, for COVID, you know, people wore masks when they were walking around and stuff. Canadians are pretty good. They mostly listen. I would say like 95, 90% of the people listened. Um, you know, it was, it was a party. It was good to be back. Good to be doing fun things. The drinks were strong. Um, George, Scott knows who George is, went to the bar to get his drinks and he came back and I thought he got me a double because it was so fucking strong. Oh. Like we'll have to, when you come, we'll have to take you to the upstairs bar, Scotty, because they poured me a cranberry and vodka and it was, it was strong and he got a fucking double. Then mind you, he's bigger than me. Right. So he can, right. he can but manage still. that shit. But, oh, man, it was like, yeah, it was party, party time. And then Halloween night was good. We had a lot of kids, not as many kids as you. I'll let you talk about that. Cause you were, you were a candy handy note machine. No, oh, good Lord. Was I ever. <laughs> <laughs> But how was your Halloween weekend? I don't know. Is there anything you want to share about what yeah. you did? Well, I mean, as we were talking about in the last episode, like uh, I had my date day with Mandy and we ended up, uh, well, we didn't end up doing a lot of the stuff we originally planned because Scott, as soon as he turned, well, smoke show, as soon as he turns 40, it just <laughs> falls a freaking part. So what you're saying, you was too afraid to go to the haunted house? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want to pee your pants on the first yeah. date? But no. Well, your I, first date, but yeah. <laughs> I literally hurt my back again, like earlier in the Aww. week. And by Friday, it was healed, but I did not want to risk, like, since it was just starting to heal again, I did not want to risk stressing it out, like going to the haunted house. So we had originally canceled that. And then we were like, all right, well, we'll just go to the orchard. We'll do corn maze. We'll, you know, just kind of uh, see if there's any other fun outside Halloween activities we could do. And of course, the entire day, it was raining. And I know that sucks. Yeah flooded out the entire corn maze so we couldn't even do the corn maze (laughs) you have to be swimming through the corn maze yeah (laughs) then it would be uh sharks of the corn or whatever that movie oh yeah (laughs) shout out to rebecca reinhart one of the hardest working indie stars uh, in the horror community but uh yeah so we ended up just walking around the orchard and just uh enjoyed the sights and then we ended up grabbing some cinnamon donuts while we were there grabbed me a big old jug of apple cider because if you're in an apple orchard Gotta at least grab some uh, cider. And then, Absolutely. Uh, then we ended up going out to Frankenmuth and walked around there and checked out some stores, got something to eat. Just had a great time all together. Then we came back home and uh, rewatched Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> Which was very fitting because I went out as that. I feel right. like you did that in tribute, obviously, because everything's about me. Scott, it was. Yeah, it sure. was totally in tribute to you. Absolutely. It's like this I one's for Heather also... Powell. <laughs> you like put your hands up like in the Hunger Games. May the odds ever be in her favor. Because <laughs> I know how hard Heather's gonna party tonight. Uh... Um... <laughs> It's true though. You knew, you knew. Um, oh, I know. You know. But yeah, I was. Uh, I was. My other part-time job is uh, Scotty's public relations representative as well. Um, <laughs> he shared some pictures of him and his friend Mandy on uh, on Facebook. Very lovely photos. Oh, thank you. Um, and a lot of our listeners are Facebook friends with you, so they probably saw those photos as well. Um, and she's a very beautiful woman, and it looks like you guys had a wonderful time. So I'm really glad you enjoyed your day. Um, Saturday, I know you did your usual magic, I think, right? Uh, no, we ended up actually ended up just chilling here, watching some horror films because uh, no one was getting together for magic. Oh, so, uh, good. Yep, so I just had a relaxing evening at home, and then Sunday, got dressed up, which I shared pictures to our Facebook mm-hmm. page. And You look great. Oh, thank you. And, uh, yep, gave out a candy to all the trick-or-treaters, and, yeah, I think I had about 700 pieces of candy, and by the end of the night, we only had 100 pieces left. Uh, we had about 250 trick-or-treaters. That's awesome. I think yeah. I had close to 60 or 70, which is pretty good um, for where I live, and... I bought a lot of candy and I'm very generous, right? Like I, I spent a lot on the candy and I wanted to give out a lot. So I separated it this year to can it candy that was peanut and nut free candy Aww. that was gluten free and candy that was like peanut butter cups and stuff like that. And I asked all the kids mm-hmm. and I asked all the parents, you know, do you have any allergies? Is there anything you can't eat? I didn't have one single kid that had allergies. Oh, wow. So that tells you that either their parents don't let them go trick-or-treating <laughs> or there isn't as many allergies as we think. Um, 
So, but I ended up just giving a lot away. And then these young ladies that were dressed like absolutely awesome came by at the tail end of the night, just after a chicken costume, like a big blow up chicken. Like this guy was in this chicken costume running down the street. It was like the coolest fucking shit I've ever seen. That's and awesome. these young ladies came back and I was just tired. It was like 8.15. I was cold because I handed out candy from my garage. So kids didn't have to walk up the stairs to get into my, my house or to my right. porch. Um, and I just kind of ended up splitting the bowl up between the five of them. And you would have thought they won the fucking jackpot, right? Like you remember being that age, they were like 12, oh, yeah. 13. So that cusp were, you know, at some point, maybe trick-or-treating isn't the cool thing to do anymore. Uh, and I was, and I'm not one of those assholes either that gives a fuck if you're wearing a costume or not, right. because there's neurodivergency people that are out there. And you know what, if you show up at my door, I don't care if you look like you're 80. I don't care if you look like you're exactly. well, we're young, your parents take you around. I'll give you candy. Um, and they just like, they were like, we love your costume. Cause I was dressed as cat in the hat. And like, they were just really, really cool. It was, it was a really fun, happy experience. And I took some stuff from COVID last year in the sense of handing candy outside, splitting stuff up, wearing gloves, like gloves were part of my costume, but I just wore them when right. I had to keep the candy. Um, but yeah, it was, I thought it went really well, but besides the shitty weather. I thought Halloween was pretty good this year. Wait, you had a shitty weather? Well, not on Halloween, but on the weekend of like Friday, oh, yeah. we were also in a trident, like rain fucking storm. I was driving to Niagara in like a fucking hurricane. And I was like, what the fuck am I doing with my life? This convention better be fucking worth it. Oh. And I couldn't even drink when I got there because, well, I had a drink, but I got to drive back, right? Right. And I knew I was going to like try to poison myself the next day, which I proudly did. Not as bad as last <laughs> year's devil did. night. <laughs> Not as bad as last year's devil night. I stayed away from the shots at one point. Amber and Dave and George and I were all chilling and they're like, oh, we should do shots. I'm like, none for Heather. Heather learned. <laughs> Good for you. Lesson last year. Heather doesn't play that because Heather's going to go home and fucking puke all night if she, yeah, if she goes down that road. Yeah, I'll say. I remember Devil's Night experience chatting with you. That was uh, hmm, quite, a, quite a scene. <laughs> yeah, man. I was, I was fucked up. Yeah, you year. were. <laughs> that is the only way to it um speaking of like fucked up i loved lucas dickinson shared a meme to our facebook page if anyone's not on the friday nightmare page please join us we'll let anybody in scott and i for fuck's sakes run it anyone can join um <laughs> so true <laughs> but he, it was like the pet cemetery which made me think of this right oh yeah Gage and it's mariah carey's all i want for christmas and gage like it's the kid in the trucks the the Mariah Carey song and I find that fucking shit hilarious because it's true November hits and all of a sudden a fucking song comes on everywhere you go to mm -hmm. everywhere and that is why I have been like standing my ground this entire week so people probably have noticed but every day this week I have posted a meme that is basically anti-Christmas because it's just like well I mean obviously for us Americans not for you but we still have Thanksgiving coming up and Oh, we still have Thanksgiving coming up and, you know, it just gets, it's still a crappy holiday because, you know, force fed bullshit lies throughout school about what it actually is. Oh, you mean how, how colonization went? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, it's no better up in Canada. Don't worry. We have that bullshit too that we're contending with, but yes. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, at the same time, it's like, at least let the other holiday hit before you bring in Christmas bull crap. It's like, yeah. give us that little space. Like, cause Thanksgiving just kind of gets bowled over. I mean, the only reason I like Thanksgiving is for my family to see my family anyways. But it's like, you know, I don't need to be reminded about Christmas as soon as the, the clock strikes 1201 freaking Halloween night turning November 1st and be like, Oh, Christmas music for the rest of your life. Yeah, it is weird how it goes. And you know what? If that's your thing and it makes you happy, yeah. do you at the end of the day, right? I just don't I, want to deal with it. But I, yeah, if it makes you I happy, you. go for it. I get you. It's like here, we have something called Remembrance Day and that falls on November 11th. And that's when we remember um, people that have chosen to serve um, in Canada's armed forces, naval forces. Uh, originally started with World War One, World War Two, the veterans from there. Um, and I do, I do. Um, acknowledge it. My grandfather served um, in the Second World War, and both grandfathers did actually. And to me, I want to acknowledge the sacrifices that they made. Actually, right. my one grandfather was on the beaches of Dieppe and survived. Oh, wow. um, so you can imagine what he saw. Right. Um, 
And, you know, and I've had friends that have served in Canadian Armed Forces too. And of course, like, I'm not trying to be pro-army on this call or on this, on this podcast, but I do like to acknowledge people who have made that choice to serve their country. Yeah. So I don't put up any Christmas decorations or do anything like that before uh, November 11th. And I usually wait till November 24th, 25th, because as you see here, we don't have Thanksgiving. Our Thanksgiving was in October. So I usually wait till about a month before and I take down my Christmas decorations by January 2nd. Like I don't keep up my shit long. Right. Like usually it's about the 24th, 25th of November to um, January 2nd. And I, <laughs> and I bought this grumpy, you'll see it when you come up, Scott, this br- grumpy cat, um, one to match my whimsical dog that I'm going to put on my lawn. <laughs> nice. um, so, but I hear you though. I, you guys still have Thanksgiving yeah. and the, and the sacred holiday that is Black Friday. Um, oh boy. You know, like honestly, and Cyber Monday, the other sacred holidays. So really that's, I celebrate those holidays if it makes you right. any better. As a Canadian, I do celebrate the, the sacred holiday of Black Friday and the uh, sacred holiday of Cyber Monday. <laughs> yeah, because that is like usually when I will get start to get into the Christmas spirit. Chris, how, the Christmas holiday for me has been kind of crap the last couple of years anyways. Yeah. But if I'm going to do anything Christmassy, I always wait till Black Friday. Because it's the day after Thanksgiving, and then it's officially the month until the month until the Christmas holiday. So it's like, yeah, I'll maybe throw on a Christmas movie or something like that. And if I'm in the mood, I may decorate. But 95% of the time, I don't decorate because I just don't care. <laughs> now, here's a member, Barry. Usually you do that. Oh, yeah, you remember? Oh, yeah, I remember. Yeah. Um, but we got together. Was it the first weekend of December that I came out there two years ago and we saw Gremlins? Sure and was. The theater was all done up with the gremlin. And wasn't there like a Christmas tree in the theater? And yep. there was like a gremlin on it or something like that. Yep, there was a big old gremlin prop replica. We should find that picture and share it to our page on our two year meeting anniversary. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, I, was like, I think totally... that was uh, because <laughs> yeah, I think I shared it to my main page. So yeah, I can pull that back up. Yeah, and... we, we need to do a, a, t- a throwback um, uh, Friday Nightmares pay picture of you and I in our first meeting and then you know what when you come up for December we'll do and where we are now and it's like you <laughs> the finger we tell you yeah, to fuck off. You. you look because the first step, <laughs> first picture we're all like oh nice and happy like I know. To meet each other <laughs> by now we're just like ah fuck like off. I'm sticking my finger up your nose and like, <laughs> <laughs> giving like a ridiculous stare it's sneaking great. videos of me making a fool of myself and laughing oh, about man. it oh uh, you know what you you don't at all like we you're a good sport though like wow. that video that we posted of calling you a bitch in your face was the best from when you came up here last time oh that was so much fun and you know me I have no shame so I'm all about just making the silly shit um yeah but I think you also know it's in fun right oh yeah absolutely um, like you know what I mean but I I think we should totally share that picture I can't believe it's been two years and we went out to that pub uh, that was really good food that we had at that pub and it was really good cider too oh man yeah i remember the yeah. drinks <laughs> yep aberrant aberrant ales was the place oh fuck that was good times daddy yep that was december 6th that we did it was it december 6th i was wondering if it was the 5th or the 6th but it was the 5th yeah, or think, the 6th i think you came in town december 5th the 5th and then stayed till the 7th right yep. yeah yeah and then you left the, the morning of the 7th yes because i had a big event to get back for yeah, you did. Um, <laughs> shit, that was, yeah. Oh, yeah, I did. Yeah, I got really am that night, too. <laughs> we noticing a pattern. <laughs> I'm definitely noticing a pattern here. Oh, man. Dude, hey, just <laughs> wait. You were fucking just as sloshed as I was the last weekend you were here. And you know oh, it's going to yeah. be round two next time you come up. Oh, um, you know I'm down to party. No, I know. I know. It'll be great. But anyway, it's been it's been a good time. And we want to thank everybody Uh, for sharing the ideas for topics. Scotty and I were running low on ideas and we're going to do all the ones that were suggested. We're slowly going to move through them and we will do them. Um, Thank you for making our lives easier. And thank you for listening. Uh, I checked our numbers today and we increase downloads every month. And it really means a lot to Scott and I that you choose to listen to this podcast. Uh, We appreciate you and we're grateful for you. And thank you. Um, yeah. We love all of you. And I just have to ask the question. Are you guys okay? 
is there is there something you need to talk about? Because I'm kind of worried. You listen to us? <laughs> well, you listen to Scott. <laughs> you listen to Scott. We're funny though, Scott. We have a and we're like we're like yeah, like what you like, but you're dumb if you got if you really like <laughs> Halloween kills. <laughs> Evil dies tonight, Scott. Evil Evil dies tonight. (laughs) But in all joking, Scott and I do put a lot of effort into this, and I think we've grown a lot as podcasters. At least I have. Scott was already good. No, whatever. (laughs) So I've grown. Um, You've already been. You were already better. Ah, nah. We're the same, Scott. We're both 10 (laughs) out of 10s, even with our shirts off. (laughs) Yeah. Next next episode, we're recording topless. Woo! Man, that would probably get a lot of viewers actually <laughs> hell yeah it would <laughs> i think people would definitely watch that um yeah so anyway thank you to everyone and we'll be doing something a little bit different and special in december kind of keep it a little spicy yeah, uh I like it spicy. Some, some international connections when we'll just leave it at that that what, we will what? be making this december um but in the meantime let's get to our 2021s we don't have all fucking nights scott has a date and a bar to get to and i got a fucking football game to watch so we need to get down to business pfl everyone not nfl the canadian football league the league no one cares about (laughs) so have you seen this one i think you told me about this one Um, i'm i don't see anything on our screen (laughs) you can't see it (laughs) all i see is play again go to library library play previous list so i don't know (laughs) what that is that you can't me. how about this now scott do you see it now hey there we go all right (laughs) (laughs) you know what the best is that was sitting there for a while before he said anything i know because i was just waiting i'm like oh she'll switch it over (laughs) (laughs) that's really funny all right let's get this bitch started Uh, yes i did i did see this one i was the one that recommended it all right you introduce this bad boy then all right so the first movie we gonna talk about is <laughs> go talk about <laughs> we're gonna talk about this movie here we're talking about this movie right here it's, it's a good it's a good right here i'm gonna tell you what i tell you what i'm in rare form today people sorry <laughs> it's friday we just finished work and we're overly excited <laughs> yes <laughs> so the first movie we gonna talk about is <laughs> The Deep House. Uh, the synopsis is, while diving in a remote French lake, a couple of YouTubers who specialize in underwater exploration videos discover a house submerged in the deep waters. What was initially a unique finding soon turns into a nightmare when they discovered the house was the scene of atrocious crimes. I will leave it at that. Um, I read the synopsis and I'm going, well, so basically this is a house, a haunted house underwater. I am very interested. This is unique. And I am very pleasantly surprised by this film. This one, just the acting I thought was all well done. The mm-hmm. YouTubers were not super annoying like most YouTuber type people that are on the movies they sure. are. Um, and this one just had this like constant sense of claustrophobia and dread. Like it was just a very creepy film the whole way through. Like I was, I was pretty much on the, I I hate this term, but I was on the edge of my seat the whole time. Just like, okay, what the fuck's going to happen around this next corner? Mm -hmm, Like mm -hmm. it was very, very well done and intense. And I enjoyed the story. I thought like the reasoning for why everything was happening, like was great. Nice. Yeah. You see it too, right? Yeah, yeah, I've seen it. I, I think you're being really, like, I like how you're being really discreet because you do have to watch this movie to fully get it. Yeah. Uh, it's an 85-minute runtime. Our good friend Sander Kane, woo-hoo, from Cemetery Gates podcast, gave it three oh. and a half stars, and I got to agree with him. Happy birthday, Sander. Happy birthday, Sander. We're recording this on Sander's birthday. So Sander's turned 21 years old today. We're really excited for him to be feller. able to drink in the united states finally um you know what it's not bad it's it's a very good little different take on found footage and haunted house films and i really respected the ending i yeah. thought it was realistic i i thought they did a really good job i think for a vod this is worth a 3.99 4.99 rental i don't know if it will be a top contender for you know your top list i don't know it really depends i think it could be if you're really into haunted houses I think this yeah. absolutely could be a contender. So I definitely recommend checking it out. It's definitely one that you shouldn't uh, let slip by if you get a chance to watch it. 
and i'm looking now it doesn't look like is it do you see it available anywhere because no it's but i'm pretty sure it's available for vod maybe on itunes usually is where you can find shit if it's nowhere else but okay if not it should be dropped soon and this could be something that shutter picks up next year um, yeah that could be because that's what happened with uh, the closet that was available through oh VOD, yeah and now it's available on shutter now scott though, and i watched that last year wait the closet's on shutter all oh, must be canadian shutter oh yeah can, oh you know you don't see it okay well it's yeah, on it's canadian not on my shutter. list <laughs> Canadian Shutter gets it, but yeah. Um, so the next one is a little anthology that stole from other anthologies. Which is fine. That it did. And you know what? I, I assume you just buy the rights to the movies and then show them in your anthology. So <laughs> it's fine. This is called Grave Intentions. It's an 88-minute runtime. The anthologies are actually quite good. Um, I really actually liked one about a father and son. I thought that that was really, really well done for a low budget film. I also enjoyed the first story in this quite a bit too. I thought it was a very subtle scary without doing any kind of real blood or gore. But, and there was one in here that I've seen in other ones as well, which is a very good story. But the wraparound looks like it was filmed um, with somebody's like, uh, like a Halloween at an open, like one of those garage ha- haunted houses. And someone was just <laughs> pretending to be a practicing witchcraft. It's a little cheesy. Um, but as anthology goes, I think the anthologies, for most of them being pretty low budget, were pretty good. Uh, I found them entertaining enough. It has, Scott gave it a two and a half star rating. I would probably give it a three and a half, three star rating on Letterbox. I think I enjoyed it a little bit more than he did. I did enjoy the first story a little bit more. If you're yeah. a, sorry, go ahead, Scott. I'll say there's a reason for that little when I talk about it. Well, go ahead, talk about it. Okay, so yeah, like uh, the, the reason I'm giving it like a two and a half is because uh, there's only like two stories that really kind of stuck out to me. One you referenced earlier being like one that's been seen a billion times before. Mm-hmm. The other one actually just pissed me off. And it was just because of uh, what happened to a living thing, let's just say. Oh, okay, yes. And I was messaging Heather about it. And I was just like so upset and pissed off. And I'm like, well, if that was the point of the movie, good job. You did, you got me pissed. But oh, I did not like that. And that like really just felt wrong and mean spirited. Yeah, that is a and, very fair statement to make. And being who I am, I was just like, nope, I, I do not like that. So it's like the other stories, I honestly just don't remember. See, that tells you probably not. So, you know, if you really like anthologies and you're someone that likes to watch every single anthology, I would say check this out. Right. And to be fair, I did watch a lot of 2021s this last two weeks. So it could just be everything's blending together right now. It wasn't that great. So as I said, (laughs) if you really like anthologies, it's worth your time. It is available on Google Play, Microsoft Store, YouTube, Amazon, Prime Video. If you have it for free, absolutely. It's a great free little watch. If you have to pay for it, I would say two ninety nine would be yeah. the top, of the, top of the line that you want to be paying for this bad boy. Now, Scotty, why don't you introduce the next one? All right. So the next one is a Netflix original, and it's a sequel to a film from last year. And that is Nobody Sleeps in the Woods Tonight Part 2. I remember enjoying Nobody Sleeps in the Woods tonight, the first one, Mm -hmm. a decent amount because it had a lot of homages to other slasher films and like Mm -hmm. certain kills. And it was just a fun all around Polish slasher. However, this one went in a very sequelitis weird direction. Um, added a new element to this story about how people like how the killers are what they are um went a really i thought decent uh path for the first two acts the third act hits and you're going what the fuck am i watching <laughs> what is this <laughs> like it was it was so weird and just kind of ridiculous and just eye rollingly bad and it was definitely a step down from the first one um, it had still some amazing kills, like in some really cool practical effects, but the storyline was ridiculous and there wasn't any character I really cared for in this one. Yeah, I feel like where the first one followed a specific formula, this one followed no formula and had 18 different writers that had you know, 25 different ideas of how this movie was supposed to go. <laughs> right. Um, it's fine, I guess. 
if you really want to watch something on Netflix, I I honestly like the first one a lot more. This was kind of a letdown for me, but yeah. it has a 1.9 rating on Letterboxd. So apparently Scotty and I aren't the only ones who felt that way. Uh, I don't know if you really like the first one and you want to see how this continues, you can watch the second one. But for me, this is kind of along the lines of Don't Breathe 2. You're better off just watching the first one. <laughs> right. And just yeah. leaving it at that um so yeah let's oh, oh. <laughs> everyone i would like to announce that this is scott's number one movie of oh good lord <laughs> she's been teasing he, me about this he's really excited about the relationship in this film this film is called la and it is a uh 2021 <laughs> release it is an a24 jizz fest and it's a 106 minute runtime and it is about a couple that keep a lamb and raise it as a baby <laughs> i'm sorry and, and <laughs> it's, it's a half lamb half human so it's oh, spoilers on well you see it in the trailer oh but some people like dave c are listening to watch trailers now you've ruined it now we can't watch lamb <laughs> Dave, it's okay. We saved you time. Just go make a lamb chop. You'll probably enjoy it more. <laughs> um, you know what? In all fairness to A24, I joke, well-made movie, well-acted, well-filmed, quality film. And I got the message they were portraying in this film. I did applaud the special effects, both CGI and practical. Amazing. I think they captured rural life very well. I think the exploration of the relationship was done very well. All the relationships. Um, It just wasn't for me. Not a bad movie. And if people put this in their top 10 of the year, I would totally understand why. Same way I feel about St. Maud. Um, It just didn't work for me. But I can see why A24 picked it up. Well-made film. Um, not a lot of horror in it. It definitely, but it does advertise itself as a drama in all fairness to it. Like, right. I think we just assume because A24 picked it up, it's a horror film. Like, I think that's more horror fans just jumping to that conclusion. Um, I, I think it's because you... it's just weird enough to be horror. It is. And like, you could argue that, you know, Scott gave it away. A half lamb human baby is scary. Um, and it's, you know, part of mythology and stuff like that. And there is some sad scenes to it. The ending is very, is very much a gut punch. I would say to you, if you enjoy, um, movies with strong metaphors in it, if you liked last year's Swallow or you enjoyed The Witch even, or other stuff like that, I think you'll appreciate this film. It just wasn't my jam. Um, any thoughts you have on it, Scotty? Yep. Cause I actually did just finish it right before we recorded. So I did get to the end finally, but um, yeah, uh, this was one that I was teasing Heather about because she was just like, oh, this is a 24. Scott's going to blow it because <laughs> uh, I do love me some a 24. And I'm like, I am more on the lines of this is just weird enough that I have to see it. And yep, that's pretty much what I got. Just weird. It was really, like you said, well-made, well-acted, like really well put, put together. It's a little bit of a slow burn, but at the same time, like, it's paced very well so it's interesting like it's interesting yeah and not a whole lot of dialogue compared to like most films like no but a24 doesn't like to have a lot of dialogue right like and but yeah this one just left me wondering (laughs) like what 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 huh see i didn't find it as weird as you did like i got the messages behind oh i did too I, I just, just, I just was like, I think also for the culture that I think this was made in Finland. Uh, yeah, Finnish I think film, so. Right. I think perhaps there was more cultural meetings for them. Oh yeah. Um, there were some animal parts in here that were hard for me. Yeah. Um, because if you know a lot about babies taking, being taken away from their mothers, it's, it's, it makes it a little tough to watch, but you know, it's a movie, you know, <laughs> like it is what it is. Um, I would, it's available on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, Microsoft Store. I think if this is, you know, slow burns, A24 is your jam, you're an A24 completist, or some of the movies you talked about, you really like metaphors in your movies. I think a $4.99, $5.99 rental is worth it. This movie is well done. You're yeah. not going to be disappointed. I'd watch it again for the cute little lamb that's in it. Like, I'm not going to lie, the, the lamb child is pretty fucking adorable. So that kind of won me over. Um, not yep. be on my top list at the end, but I would never criticize someone who did have it on there. Like, it's a good movie. Yeah, I, I gave it a 7 out of 10. So it's still like a good movie. Well done. It just, yeah, it was just, it was a strange one. Yeah, just wasn't your jam, right? Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, we can jump on into the next one, which is a Shutter exclusive. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is Horror Noir, not to be confused with the Horror Noir documentary, which is exactly what I thought this was. I thought this was a follow up to that documentary. And well, no, it was a uh, two and a half hour long anthology with mm-hmm. all uh, all black directors, uh, majority black cast, like everything done like in that style. And uh, I found it to be a bit long in the tooth, honestly. Mm. Uh, a lot of the stories either went on for way too long when they should have ended a little bit sooner. Um, none of the stories really grabbed my attention and held me. Mm. I found them all to just be kind of okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think there's actually one out of here that I could pick as, oh, this was absolutely my favorite. I think they were all just kind of the same for me, like, in okay yeah they were fine but Mm -hmm. it's i wasn't uh blown away by this one it wasn't bad but i wasn't blown away i i really like this one oh okay Um, the more i sit on it the more i really enjoyed majority of the stories um one of my favorite one has to do with a father and a son because i think it was actually really exploring some stereotypes and some issues um and i thought bravo on that director for going there um and I thought that was really fucking well done. Uh, the beginning story was the only one that I was kind of a little confused on. I didn't really get what was happening. Uh, but the other ones, the graffiti one I thought was excellent. The the vampire one I thought was really fun. Um, yeah, I, and the cult one I thought was really good too. And uh, shout out to the woman that's from The Craft, Rachel. Rachel. Oh, like that was that. her, wasn't it? Yeah. Rachel True. Rachel True's in this. There's actually Tony Todd's in this. Malcolm Barrett's in this. There's some really great Black actors that are, that are in this film. Uh, I, I do agree with Scott. It goes on for a long time. I liked it. I, I liked it more than he did. But you know what? It's a free watch on Shudder. So I will say if you have Shudder and you like anthologies and you have the time, it's worth your time. Yeah. I don't think it's overly political personally. Um, I think the one with the graffiti is funny of some of the stuff he says about white people. Like, oh yeah, and it's not an insult to white people. It's actually really funny. And there's a line that said back that I would use to quote in papers that someone says back to him. And it's actually a really good point. And, but I didn't think it was, you know, over the top, you know, political or anything like that at no. all. I think it was just sh- different storytelling from different perspectives. Yep. Um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it quite a bit. So you got two different perspectives on it. So check it out if you have Shutter. Yeah. Cause I think I want, I think this one I gave a three out of five on Letterbox. So like, yeah, I would probably average. give it a four, four and a half. Oh, nice. I liked it. Yeah, I liked it a lot more than you did, which is fair, right? You know, everything connects with people differently. I just watched this one today. (laughs) How Um, was this? You know, it wasn't bad. It has a 3.8 rating on Letterboxd, and I think that's because, like, not a lot of people have watched it. Uh, It's a 108-minute runtime. The name of the movie is The Parapod, A Very British Ghost, A Very British Ghost Hunt very british uh they make a lot of british references <laughs> and a lot of comments throughout this movie it's a mockumentary um the acting is really good and there were some parts where i literally jumped like some stuff happened that really really startled me i was working and i like, almost knocked my, oh, my wow. coffee mug over it startled me um but it was more like jump scare startled me right. you know like bah, bah, look at my guy, right <laughs> it was like a conjuring film <laughs> anyway <laughs> So I, I think for a mockumentary that was like medium budget, they did a pretty good job. The two actors in it are pretty good. I, I thought they were pretty awesome. They definitely made me believe they were just two friends making this film. I don't know if they'd ever even met each other. So I bought into the fact that they had maybe just met each other, but I found the ending really was a letdown. They could have done a lot more with it. But if mockumentaries is your thing, this should be avail- available to rent soon. Yet again, this may be something that's picked up by Shutter or Prime. Um, Definitely, I don't. This is a Netflix film. I think this will be a Shutter or Prime kind of thing that will get picked up. And I would say if you do find it to rent somewhere, three ninety nine, four ninety nine rental is fair. And I guess I'll do the next one, and then Scotty can take over from there because he All watched right. a whole bunch. So just before we recorded, I watched the most recent paranormal activity movie, Next of Kin. It's a 98-minute runtime. You do not need to see the other previous paranormal movies in order to watch this one. I don't know. If you like paranormal activity movies, you'll probably like this one. It's it's not as... Okay, you know how the first paranormal activity was just basically about a ghost in a house? Yeah. And then they built on the lore of everything. So this one comes with a new lore 
Oh, Basically, okay. They've included a lore and a haunting and weird ass like shit happening all in an Amish community. Um, it's fine. You know, for a paranormal sound footage film, I had a good enough time with it. Uh, would it be super ranked high for me? Probably not. I'd probably give it a two and a half to three on letterbox. Like I was entertained, but I didn't think it was the right. best, but I, I don't love all para, para, paranormal activity movies either. Right. Like I think they're okay. Um, so yeah, yeah, if you're into, sorry. I'll say, yeah, I haven't watched any after three. So. Okay. Well, yeah. So like, I, I think you would, I think perhaps if you and Mandy over and you guys just wanted to throw on something and be like, Hey, let's watch some found footage. It's a good found footage film. Like, they do a pretty good job of making a decent little found footage film. The acting in it is good. The filming's quite good. They do some cool little camera tricks in it. Uh, some good jump scares, you know, like what the paranormal franchise is known for. Creepy right. shit that you record, <laughs> right? So if you like that stuff, it is available on Prime, Amazon Prime Canada, and it is available on Paramount, Paramount and Amazon Channel and Paramount Plus. So unfortunately, there is only a handful of places you can watch it. But uh, yeah, if, you, if you're into paranormal activities, you'll probably enjoy this one. And I'll let you talk about your five. Yeah. All right, Scotty. Tell us uh, what you got. Put the, put the show on my shoulders and got this going. All now. right. Time for you to do it. <laughs> time for me to shine. Uh, so the like I said, I watched a bunch. There's actually about three or four other ones that I didn't even add to this list. Um, but uh, the first one I'm going to talk about here is called Matched. And it is about a uh, provocative, character-driven story that explores the obsessions, betrayals, and psychosis of online dating. And it is basically a comedy thriller, very low budget, um, but it's basically the story is about this guy accidentally swipes and matches with this girl because he didn't mean to swipe. You know, that does happen on these apps sometimes where you just accidentally swipe. And she gets all excited because she's like basically falling in love with him before she even met him. And yeah, he blocks her and she gets pissed, creates a new profile and basically cat catfishes him and ends up being basically, this is, this could be an exaggerated version of the dangers of online dating, catfishing, uh, people portraying not to be who they are, um, dating someone that could be a freaking psychopath. Like it's, I am like, I related with this one. I'm not going to say this is for everybody, but I know. Brandon, you are the psychopath. Yes. <laughs> Randy, run! <laughs> <laughs> run! <laughs> but uh, Brandon Orlick suggested this one because uh, uh, he he knew I would probably uh, get a kick out of this one just because you know I've been on the online dating scene and I've dealt with a lot of this type of stuff in a in a similar fashion. But uh, yeah, the acting in it is hokey, not the best at times, but it's actually quite entertaining, funny for the first half, and uh, a bit just unsettling and off-putting for the last half and like all around I found this to just like it struck a chord with me I'm not gonna say it's like the greatest thing in the world but it's definitely one of those really indie low-budget films that just kind of hit the right notes for me because of the stuff I've dealt with in the past so yeah I had fun with it um I don't see it available anywhere so I'm guessing it might be like iTunes or something like that right now or it will be coming out soon but I, I gave it a seven out of ten like I found it entertaining enough and I would recommend uh everyone else check it out just may not be your cup of tea um the next one talk about a movie that uh completely exceeded expectations and threw me for a loop on what I expected it to be uh this movie is known by two different titles uh the one that I originally seen it as was cherry pickers but it is also known as ankle biters and it is about four adorable little girls plot to brutally murder a hockey player after they mistake an act of lovemaking as an attack on their mother and this is supposed to like the synopsis makes it go oh this is gonna be funny just because they've seen him uh doing something naughty with their mother and they thought he was actually hurting her so they're gonna kill him for it and oh this is gonna be just like a accidental mistake thing it, it, it had some cutesy bit like that but holy shit did this movie get dark was it like village of the dam no oh, okay no this was like just four cute girls like just four little girls like i would say maybe between the ages of five and seven like just small little girls that just uh very protective of their mother and she's dating this hockey player and they just happen to see one of the things that her and the hockey player do behind closed doors and they think they're hurting, he's hurting mommy. And they get yeah, plot revenge as a team. And I have to say, these little girl actors, fucking amazing. They're really? adorable and creepy at the same time when they need to be. Um, 
it played out, like I said, a way darker than I expected it to. Because I had a uh, Colin from Whose Line Is It Anyways was in it. And I'm going, oh, cool. okay, this is Colin Mockery. Quoted. Yeah, Colin Mockery. Yeah. Canadian treasure. Like this whole movie is Canadian. Totally. Oh, oh, very nice. And, uh, but as soon as I've seen him and I'm going, okay, this is going to be totally just silly. And I'm totally going to enjoy it because I love Colin Mockery. And he's only in it for a brief amount of time, but no, this, it had some comedy, but like I say, this went dark, way darker than I anticipated. And I fucking loved it. Like, nice. this is pretty high on my list. Like, I think I gave it like a nine out of 10. Like, I just had so much fun with this, mainly because I, it exceeded my expectations and did something I didn't expect to do. Like, and this is one I definitely really, really recommend because, yeah, I think it's just a lot of fun and also just very dark. Um, once again, this one does not look like it is available anywhere. So hopefully it'll be out soon or it might be on iTunes, but definitely, definitely a fun one to watch. All right, cool, Leo. Um, then the next one was one I've been super excited for um, by the director Julia Duckernow, I think is how you pronounce her name, but she uh, directed Raw. So this is her mm, follow up to Raw. Nice. Uh, and that is Titan. All right. I talked about Lamb being weird. <laughs> no, this is, <laughs> this is fucking strange. Um, Like hold my beer strange? Pretty close to it. Yeah. Okay. You could tell she was very inspired by Cronenberg in many ways. Oh, who will be talking about today? <laughs> yes, we will. <laughs> Um, but this is, uh, let's see if they actually have a good synopsis because IMDB had a shit one. All right. So yeah, following a series of unexplained crimes, a former firefighter is reunited with his son who has been missing for 10 years. That is a very vague plot synopsis. And I'm leaving it at that because the less, you know, the better, the better or more weirded out you will be. Awesome. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this one was extremely well shot, extremely well acted. The story for me drug a little bit by the second act um, and just kind of went in a completely different direction that I didn't anticipate. But altogether, this was like a solid film. Um, cool. I personally like Raw better, but I think I might just because of the storyline of that more. Mm, Raw is a good film. Yeah. But this one is a must watch for anybody by the end of the year because I will not be surprised if this makes it to people's top tens. Awesome. Good call, Scotty. Good call. Yeah. Very, very, very well done movie. Awesome. Um, and I'm very excited to see the next thing she ends up doing. Awesome. Um, the next one. <laughs> oh, boy. So I was scrolling through our good friend's Plex and I seen this movie. I'm going, oh, the cover of this looks disgusting. Okay, I am going to watch the trailer. And basically, this movie is called Cyst. And it's in the 1960s. A nurse's last day on her job is ruined when a doctor inadvertently creates a cyst monster that terrorizes the office. This is definitely harkens back to like the old B movies of the fifties and sixties with like the giant brain or the giant eye. And it's just like this mad doctor that's created this machine to remove like large cysts in a quicker fashion, leaving less scar tissue. However, this machine accidentally cuts off someone's cyst and oh. somehow turns it to life. And it just gets growing oh. bigger and bigger. This is, once again, more body horror. Very goopy, gooey, gross out. Uh, very tongue-in-cheek. Very meant to be like that B-movie style. I had a lot of fun with it. It was definitely super low budget. But the practical effects, there was all practical effects. And the practical effects in this were awesome. Uh, the gross out stuff reminded me a lot of like Dead Alive with the pudding scene. Okay, okay. Uh, but yeah, uh, very just fun, cheesy film. Just something I wanted to like, I was just like, this looks dumb and fun. And I was not disappointed. It was funny as hell. It was gross. It was awesome. <laughs> I'm glad you dug it. Uh, where can you find it? Uh, once again, this looks like one that's not available anywhere. Mm, you guys all gotta wait. Scott's just teasing you at the goods. I know. And um, I'm sorry, I forgot to say that for Titan. It is available on iTunes, Vudu, Google Play, AMC On Demand, and Redbox. Nice. Um, and then, yeah, the last one I will jump into is Isolation. And uh, aha, this one is available places. Yay. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Good, good. <laughs> but uh, this is actually an anthology uh, with nine shorts based on the uh, filmed during lockdown and each episode or each story is based off of uh COVID basically oh man like how people are like different stories and how people are around the world are dealing with COVID oh like everyone's dealing so good so it should be yeah. a really feel good film. <laughs> yeah because you've got like and it's of course exaggerated in some film or some stories of course but uh 
yeah, all around, I found most of these stories to be good. Some hit a little too close to home. Some made me laugh because there's one about a conspiracy theorist that thinks that 5G is now in her uh, 5G caused COVID and that the uh, CIA is listening listening to her through her freaking uh, fillings in her teeth and all this shit. So you got, no, like, man. yeah, you got like, it's, it's pretty much hitting all walks of life with each different story. Uh, and, wow. Yeah, I, I had fun with it, though. Yeah, if you are one that's just not wanting to deal with being reminded of what we're going through, or you're just, it makes you just a little uncomfortable thinking about it, wouldn't recommend this one. Okay. But if you're one that's just like, yeah, let's see what kind of movies can come out of this pandemic. Well, here you go. This one has some pretty good stories. One of the stories was directed and acted uh, by Larry Fessenden, who's just always nice. Amazing. Nice. Yeah. So there's there's some talent behind this, and yeah, I found it to be pretty dang entertaining. Like I, awesome. I liked it better than the other anthologies we talked about so far. Well, I'll have to check that one out because I do like anthologies a lot. They're my jam. Yeah. Um. Wow. Like Scotty, how do you feel? Like I feel like you just fucking went balls to the walls on these 2021s i went through a freaking marathon like i said there's like four more i could have talked about but i'm like yeah (laughs) we didn't want to be here all night we got bars to get to people to visit football games to watch scotty and i are busy people that's Um, right we're important people too (laughs) we're important absolutely well we've given you a nice little list there uh of where we're at we're going to be slowing down with our 2021 watches probably i don't know probably not you think you are okay well i'm going to be slowing down with my 2021 watches scott wants to catch up a little bit more um so yeah it'll be interesting to see what we come up with in the next little bit so and we still got some some other films that are coming out that we're kind of excited for that will show out at the end of the uh, episode yes we in, do yeah we do yeah we do yeah we do <laughs> in terms of older films i finally got around to watching Piowack, and this is a 2017 film I kind of skipped over it, but I had heard about it. Like I had heard podcasters reference it. Actually, Venom is someone that comes to mind that he's Mm -hmm. mentioned this film. I don't know if he liked it or not. I I think he he was pretty high on it. Was he? Yeah. Um, And it was a TIFF film. It was a film that was shown at the Toronto um, International Film Festival. And it was also a Canadian film that was made in Canada. And I enjoyed it. Not because it was made in Canada and not because it was shown at TIFFs. I thought it was a very good take on witchcraft. And mm-hmm. what can happen if you fuck with things? And I thought the interactions between the daughter and the mom were very legit. I thought the acting of everyone involved, I felt like I was just watching somebody's life. Like it didn't feel like yeah. a motion picture. I felt like I was just watching these people interact and it was creepy. It was creepy. I enjoyed it. I'm glad I finally got around to checking it out. If you enjoy uh, witchcraft like movies and you like very raw, real filmed movies where it feels like you're just watching someone's life i i recommend it have you seen it scotty yep i watched it the year it came out um i wasn't as high on it as you are but i was also not in a good place at the time because i was Mm. hospitalized and watching it on my phone so probably not like the best time to be watching a movie like that so it's one that i would like to eventually revisit because i have a feeling i would like it a lot more now nice awesome well i'm glad that you've at least seen it and now i can add it to stuff i've seen right (laughs) slowly i'm getting through like i feel like i'm getting through these bigger ones that other podcasters have talked about that i missed because i just wasn't watching movies to the same extent that i am now um hopefully now i'm not talking about something and somebody's going like hey i'm gonna go check that out you know i I do have one that i want to recommend to you oh sure I, i think you would absolutely love Sure. Um, now I think it was from 2018 or 2019, but uh, Tigers Are Not Afraid. Yeah, I've been avoiding that one because of some of the content in it, but I, I think I'm ready. Yeah, I just because of the politicalness of it too, I think you would, it, it's right up your alley. It is a bit like heavy, but yeah. Yeah, I just don't like the things with kids, you know? Yeah. Like it's one thing, right? That's silly and that doesn't happen, yeah. but like some other stuff is a little too real for me. Um, but that's cool. I'll definitely check it out. Um, did you have an older film you wanted to shout out? Uh, I did not watch any older films. Like uh, besides, I did uh, rewatches for Halloween, like of yeah. older stuff that like Trick or Treat, Halloween, blah, blah, blah. Type, what did you watch like Hall- Halloween night, Scotty? Uh, I ended up watching House on Haunted Hill, the original, because like I said, that's one of my traditions. That's right. And uh, I threw on Young Frankenstein while the Trick or Treaters were out. That's awesome. Well, we'll break into what we've been listening to. Uh, I would like to shout out Cameron Sullivan from the Jack up review show uh cameron has asked me a long time ago to listen to a show unfortunately i've been drowning in my jobs and graduate school which will be over soon yeah graduate in hopefully a month um but 
I I checked out his show and they're going through their top um, 10 movies ever, like all time favorite films. And man, does this guy know fucking cinema. Cameron, I don't know if you listen to our show or not, but if you do, you are a cinema god. Like he had movies that he's talking about. Like I, I feel horrible because I'm pulling a blank on them now, but like we're talking everything from the twenties all the way up to recent present day. This guy has seen like, he just watches everything and knows a lot of details about the background, how the movies are made. Like he's a true cinephile. You know, when people call themselves a cinephile, but like, they're not really a cinephile. This guy knows his shit. So if you're looking for a film that a, a, a podcast that's going to go deep dive into films and really talk about some detail. He does hyper-focused episodes on specific um, different like artists and stuff. Like he'll do stuff on Quentin Tarantino, for example. Uh, this is the podcast for you. You can find it on any place that you find podcasts. You just have to enter in the Jack Up Review Show and you'll be able to check it out. It's worth the listen. I said, his is one of those shows I've been wanting to listen to. You would like it. It's really like, it's really in depth and well-researched, like nice. really, really well done. Nice. And it's kind of funny because uh, I'm also bringing one to the table that is a friend of mine's podcast that I just had, oh, cool. to, had to finally get around to listening to and had to give a shout out to. And that is, the show is The Best Thing We Watched This Week. And it is uh, my buddy Ruben, who is part of the Pop Gaming uh, nice. team. And he has his own uh, YouTube channel, Ruby Tuesday. Go check that out. He does movie reviews and video game mm-hmm. reviews there. Um, but yeah, it's him and his uh, host, uh, Chris. And they pretty much cover all movies and like just kind of like talk about a bunch of things that they watched. Um, they do list episodes. They do news. And they will do like a review of like two movies. And for Halloween, they went nuts and did like a bunch of different horror films. They did a top five animal attack movies. Um then I think they reviewed Beaster Sunday or something like that. And like they, they covered a lot of like unique films and just like really well in depth. And just, you could tell they're having a lot of fun with it and just very well edited and put together. Cause Ruben is a master at that stuff. And yeah, I recommend everybody give him a go check out his show and then go check out his YouTube channel as well. But yeah, the best things we watched this week and his YouTube channel is Ruby Tuesdays. Awesome. 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 So we've given you lots of options to listen to. Uh, We're going to take a brief break and we're going to hear from one of our many Legion podcast friends. And then we're going to come back to talk about body horror. Look at that body. Look at that body. (laughs) Look at that body. It explodes. (laughs) So after these messages, we'll be right back. Clytus, I'm bored. What plaything can you offer me today? An obscure body in the SK system, Your Majesty. The inhabitants refer to it as the planet Earth. How peaceful it looks. (laughs) Most effective, Your Majesty. Will you destroy this Earth? Destroy it utterly. Send Rick and Danny in Wool Rocket Ajax. So, just destroy it? That's what Ming said. Don't you ever listen? Well, there's no arguing with Ming. Hail Hail Ming. Ming. Wait! You see those transmissions on the Visua screen? Crow? Nightmare on Elm Street? Chud 2? Black Belt Jones? Nightbreed? What's a critter? I've seen those things. Flash? I guess we could wait a while before the destruction. Yeah, and watch the movies. And talk about them. The Hell Ming Power Hour. Disobedience to Ming. For now. You can find us at Legion Podcast. You can find us on Facebook. iTunes. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. At www. You know what? Just Google it for yourself. Just Google it, you bastages. Hail Ming. Breaking 2? Electric Boogaloo? Samurai Cop? Army of Darkness? Flash Dance? <laughs> <laughs> we might destroy the planet if it's Flash Dance. And welcome back. 
Uh, as we discussed earlier in the opening of our episode, we are going to be talking about body horror. And I know Scott actually really digs films with body horror. Like, I think it's your thing, isn't it? Uh, it is definitely a category I really do enjoy. Um, I think mainly because a lot of the time there is a lot of really cool practical effects involved. Mm. And it's a good way to showcase people's talent. Awesome. And well, plus yeah, there's some just fucked up stories too. Yeah, there's some great special effects. Actually, body horror really bothers me. I don't really like body horror. So when we did this topic, I was like, oh my God, what maybe this is not going to choose. Um, and I was, uh, I enjoyed all of them actually. So it'd be nice to talk Yay. about them in detail. But before we get into that, there was a article that was published on Bloody Disgusting back in December 6, 2018 called Be Afraid, Be Very Afraid, an intro to body horror. I'm going to read just parts of the article. Um, so when you think of body horror, obviously David Cronenberg likely pops into mind. We'll be talking about him today. The director's earlier horror films cornered the market on gruesome, psychological, twisted transformations and the breakdown of the human body after all. But body horror existed long before with Mary, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as an earlier example. That's true. I don't think of that as body horror, but yeah. I guess it absolutely was, right? Yeah, and it totally sub- was. Totally was, right? And the subgenre has thrived and evolved long since Cronenberg left horror. Well, the one Cronenberg's left horror. Right. You could still argue <laughs> that he's around. But anyway, uh, horror is a genre that flourishes on the fear of the unknown. And this subgenre exploits the fear in the worst possible way. So body horror is a reminder that sometimes death is better. <laughs> See what we did there? Yeah. As- As we watch and discuss, while the victims are trapped inside their own bodies as it degenerates, mutates into something unfamiliar or unidentified, on a visceral level, it's disturbed because it's disturbing and gross to look on, to look at. On an emotional level, uh, body horror instills a deeper level of fear because we tend to fear losing who we are as people. A great example they talk about here is Seth Brundle's slow mutation in the fly, but we're going to get into that later. So I'm going to just skip over that part for now. But body horror, as we know it, began to emerge in the 1950s with the fly and the blob. I never really thought of that. Like, that's true. That's kind of yeah. where. No, I've never seen the original fly. Have you? Nope. I am guilty uh, not being able, not seeing that yet. Hmm, that's interesting. I wonder if we would like it. We'll have to watch it at some point. And see. I'll say it's got Vincent Price in it, so I, I, I got to watch it at some point. Oh, man, you got to check it out, right? So both standouts of horror for its time, both showcase per- showcase of practical effects, and both would eventually get remade decades later. The most prominent entry in body horror in the 60s was surprisingly Rosemary's Baby. So this classic horror film explored the fears of motherhood and poor Rosemary Woodhouse never truly had autonomy over her own body. Hmm, I get that. Her own husband drugged her and offered her up to Satan and the resulting pregnancy was controlled at every turn by surrounding witches. Yeah. Even when the Antrace baby in her womb was making her very ill. So then we get down to the 1977 body horror, which Eraser Head. I don't think I've ever seen that one. Have you? No, I've uh, most of the David Lynch films I've seen. I've not been a fan of, so I just never bothered okay. with that one. Fair enough. What about The Incredible Melting Man? I seen that one when I was a very young kid. I remember scenes of it, but I mainly remember what the VHS looked like. So I don't remember a lot from it. I just remember it was very gooey. Fair, fair. I've seen Rabbit, so have you, Um, which is also Cronenberg. So Cronenberg had already began his exploration of body horror with the 1975's um, Shivers, but Rabbit broadened the scope of horror as the lead Marilyn Chamber Rose fell herself patient zero for a zombie outbreak thanks to an experimental procedure that was thrust upon her post-motorcycle crash. The Incredible Melting Man followed an astronaut who slowly melted away upon his return to Earth. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Following serious radiation exposure in space. The film is rather dull. (laughs) I guess narratively, it's rather dull. But it's memorable for Rich Baker's fantastic makeup efforts that makes West's slow disintegration so... Is that Garnley? Garnley? Gnarly. Gnarly. Well... Um, hmm, interesting. I guess I'll have to check that out. I've never seen that one. So the 80s, sorry, go ahead. Were you going to say something, Scott? Nope. No, okay. So the 80s also explored body horror. horror. We have Alter States. We also, oh yeah, of course, right? We also have The Thing and then the classic Videodrome and Dead Ringers. I've never seen Dead Ringers. 
That is also a very good uh, Cronenberg film. Very, I, it was one I almost chose for this episode. Hmm, interesting. Well, then we have student Gordon's, Gordon's love of mm. Lovecraft delivering gooey, slimy, gory body horror in the forms of Reaminator and From Beyond. Uh, Reaminator loosely based on the short story, Herbert West Reaminator follows the exploits of Jeffrey Combs. Hubert West as his reaminating agents lead to serious undead trouble. From Beyond. Have you seen From Beyond? Yes, that movie is amazing. Oh, okay. So Jeffrey Combs uh, is Dr. Crawford Tinglehast? Is that how you say uh, it? Tingle? Nope. Tinglehast? Uh, Tillingast. Tillingast. A survivor of Dr. Pretorius? Alternative yep. reality experience gone wrong. Hmm, sounds interesting. And oh, then messed up. It's, it's good. Yeah. And then, of course, we have 1989 Society, which we covered with Mr. Darren <laughs> Wilson. Uh, body horror would remain subtle in the surreal final act and famously known as The Shunting, which Scott came on to see me watching because this website has videos. <laughs> yeah, that was... Uh, I walked right in. I'm like, ooh, the shunting. The shunting. <laughs> and then, of course, we have 1987 Hellraiser with Frank yeah. Cotton's reverse resurrection was the gory stuff of nightmares. Absolutely. Like the whole scene with the fucking tearing apart where he, like, he gets hooks in him and it fucking tears him apart. Oh, my God. Yeah. That shit's insane. And, and the scene that they're talking about, too, with the uh, being rebuilt from the blood drop. In the yes. Attic yes. That scared definitely. the shit out of yeah. me as a kid. That's true. That that was pretty intense as well. I always found the ripping apart more scary for me, uh, but that's just me. Uh, yeah, I think if I would have watched the whole thing at that time, I would have probably been freaked out by that. But yeah, I only watched, I had come downstairs while my parents were watching it. And that was the scene that was happening. It was Frank rebuilding himself from the drop of blood. And I'm going, oh, what the <laughs> fuck am I what seeing? The fuck is this <laughs> well, and if you thought the 90s were a laceland of body horror, then seek out Brain Dead, Dead Alive, which I recently watched. Excellent yeah. body horror. And Body Melt. Never seen Body Melt. Never seen that. Um, the former, oh, we know that the former, so, you know, Brain Dead, Dead Alive takes a comical approach to zombie outbreaks. The latter sees the residents of a small town being used as test subjects for a drug that causes painful death by ways of rapid decomposition. Oh, that sounds really painful, actually. Um, it wasn't until the following decade, though, that body horror would return in a big way. Eli Ross cabin fever, fever oh, made yeah. you afraid of infections with flesh eating viruses at the center of the film. James Gunn injected humor in the body horror with Slither. That was, I liked Slither quite a bit, actually. Slither's great. Right? Alien invasion leading to all forms of mutations. And then there was a human centipede. I almost picked it just to have you watch oh, it. Oh, fuck. I'm glad you skipped it. <laughs> a horror film that seeks to offend people based on the premise alone. And I feel like I don't need to go over what it is because we <laughs> yep. all know. Um, and then, of course, there's, you know, some other coming of age horror stories. Teeth, Ginger Snaps, Raw, Blue, My Mind is in the color blue. I, I never heard of that movie either. Nope. Have you? I've never heard of that one. I guess all of them have some kind of sexual theme as individuals translate into womanhood. So as body horror overlaps and bends, blends well with other subgenres of horror and offers more internal depth than outwards of body transformations, it may have begun rooted in the conscious fear of losing control of our own bodies as the characters on screen lost control of theirs via mutilation, transformation, or decomposition. Now it can reflect our medical fears, unwanted change, technological fears, Years, and even the fear of natural growth this is only the tip of the iceberg so be afraid be very afraid um i always forget that that quote's from the fly yeah i love always that. always it's such an easy quote to not think that it's from the fly right <laughs> right like i i think i had that on a trivia game I, we used to play trivia on it's a couple of nights during the pandemic we would go online scott and i and a couple of podcasters and i remember that question i don't think any of us got it and yeah, it was, I, I think i was screaming to the phone going the fly the fly because it was a tagline of a movie or whatever and that was the tagline of the fly yeah you remembered it well speaking of the fly oh let's look how right fitting that. that is all right scotty bring us in all right so the first movie we are talking about is the fly released february 13th 1987 Seth, a brilliant scientist, is elated when he successfully manages to teleport himself in his own invention, the transportation machine. But unbeknownst to him, he was not alone during the process. Uh, so, yeah, as everyone is well versed, 
this is a remake of the fly from the 50s um going a completely different route with storyline and everything and um david cronenberg at the helm with uh what we actually found out recently from our good friend derek b about how this was basically david cronenberg's way of like dealing with his mother having cancer and just kind of like showing like what cancer does to a person as it slowly pretty much destroys their body like i had no idea about that so thank heavy, you Derek heavy King. heavy yeah i had no idea either talk about heavy um fuck yeah, yeah I, and you see it when you watch this film again knowing that you're like yep it changed the movie a, a whole sh- what all like it changed and then it the uh, and me. then her doing the mercy kill yes yep Mm -hmm. yep um this movie you know what i really respect about this film uh i didn't want to watch it and it's not because i don't think it's awesome it's because it makes me so fucking damn uncomfortable uh it jumps right into it yeah like there's no real like oh them going to the party it's them talking at the party and them going back to the house and within you know the first fucking 10 minutes you learn about what this guy's trying to do and Gina Davis and um, Jeff Goldblum really do play off each other well. And him being this awkward, kooky scientist is a really good setup for what we get. And and what we get is a very long, drawn out decline of this guy. Yeah. Like for one, um, I have to say from Jeff Goldblum, I think this is probably one of his best performances he's ever given. Not Jurassic Park? No, Jurassic Park. Oh, Jurassic Park was, three. De- definitely not part three. <laughs> okay. But no, like I, I think this is probably just one of his best performances, just because of the what he goes through and the emotion and everything. But yeah, just watching that slow degeneration of his body as it's slowly like falling apart, and like when I, when most people say body horror, this is like the movie I think of, just because mm-hmm. just because the body is literally falling apart and changing. And, yeah. And once again, you know, this is Cronenberg's wheelhouse. Like a lot of his movies tackled that subgenre of horror. And there's not many people that can pull it off. And well, his son definitely has taken uh, strides to be just like him. We'll get to that though. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, I agree with you, Scott. And you know what I really appreciate about this film with the body horror piece? You know, we'll skip over the like her relationship with her like manager yeah. or whatever the fuck his name is. And because that's all just filler, right? To yeah. what we get to, which is which is the body horror, is the subtleness of the what where he first starts to turn into the fly, which is just a couple of hairs. Yeah. And I really appreciate the subtlety of that makeup up and that effect like it's one little thing that's on him and of course he's getting all the benefits right a hypersexual activity a ba- ability to be more flexible constantly craving sugar but as we know flies have a very short life span mm-hmm. they actually don't live for that long and how he slowly like when he kind of bridges that in between where he snaps at her where he's sitting down to eat a tub of fucking ice cream because he's just trying to get tons of sugar and he wants her to go through the portal and she won't and then he goes out that night and he picks up that chick and you see his face he just looks unwell yeah right and as the night goes on he looks more and more and it's subtle but it's also creepy like you kind of wonder the woman who leaves with him if she's like do you have fucking some kind of disease because he just looks sick yeah like he's not like fully gross yet but like yeah there's just like the sheen to him like he has just like just a slight discoloration to him it looks like Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and just the way that he's acting too so it's like yeah like i i know why she went home with him because you know he bet for her basically well yeah and and she he snaps that dude's fucking arm which still fucking creeps me out like i still have issues with wrist horror because of that scene it fucking makes me so uncomfortable that scene alone makes it so why i don't do arm wrestling right like how like When David Cronenberg thought of that fucking scene, like that shit is mint. Like that is fucking body horror. (laughs) When you see something and you're like, this fucking shit stays with me that I never want to do an arm wrestling because I'm terrified my wrist is going to fucking snap off. Like how smart is that? Right. Right. It's like a play on something that no one would have really thought of and use it as they fear. So clever. So clever. Anyway, like when he, and then when you get to like, I feel like there's like a stage where he just, he's kind of normal. He's getting stuff on his face and then things just go dark. Like he passes this like line to where he 
has remorse and he's upset and she feels empathy for him. And then it kind of gets dark because she finds out she's pregnant. Yeah. And of course, this is after she like, you know, this is she slept with him after the transformation has already yes. happened because he had already went through the teleporter with the fly in the pod. Yes. So she like legit has a good reason to be afraid of like what she has growing inside of her. Though she did have sex with him before he did that. Did she? I thought it was like right at like shortly after that. Cause it was like when he first uh, went in there, like, no, oh, they no, had that's sex. Right, that's Remember right. she, he was on the bed. He was super awkward and the reason why he gets upset is because he thinks she's leaving to that's go right. with, to her uh, her ex boyfriend. So really, and that's the only whole plot hole I have with this movie. For you to find out you're pregnant, you need to be at least like a month along, right? right. She would have had to miss her period, and so more than likely, the baby wasn't a maggot. But I did enjoy that scene Mm -hmm. where she gives birth to a Megan. I did think that was a very good way of looking at, you know, the fear of body horror and what you could be giving birth to. Once again, Cronenberg just going, yep, we're going to just make you sit and think about this. (laughs) Cause, and then, yeah, like the, like, as you were saying, like that instant decline. Cause like, yeah, once he hits like that certain point, cause you know, it was like a gradual change. Mm -hmm. And then when he hit that certain point, it was just downhill. Everything just started. Like his body just started falling apart fast, which unfortunately is kind of like how cancer is. It is, right? It's slow and gradual and then quick out of nowhere. And the losing of the faculties and when he breaks in and he takes her back and he finally sheds that final layer where he can no longer, and he has great dialogue. I know we're skipping over the dialogue about the fly politics or the insect politics and all that kind of shit, which is awesome. But when he sheds and he becomes the actual fly puppet, That's being, as I found out from Derek, is actually being, uh, you know, operated by Jeff Goldblum. And that's fucking amazing. Like, it's, like, it holds up today. This shit was made in 1987. And it fucking holds up today. Like, bravo, David Cronenberg, bravo. Like, I don't know what else to say in terms of praise here. Like, yeah, these effects, like, I was looking this time around, trying to see, like, okay, you know, it's an older movie from the 80s. Mm-hmm. I want to see if I can like pick out things that just look extremely cheesy now. And it just looks so fucking gross and realistic. I could not like the only part that looks cheesy is the puppet. And that's just because you can tell it's a puppet. That's about it. Like, and it's yeah, not it like it's cheesy. Bother it's still, me. No, it doesn't bother me. I'm yeah. just not, like, like I said, I was just looking for it just to see if there mm, was okay. a way to see it and you could see it, but it wasn't that noticeable where it would take away from the film. It's just, it's amazing looking. It's I agree. Every bit of it. Like, I agree. And it's like, uh, we kind of talked over it, but like, uh, talked, didn't talk about it, but, uh, when his body, like when he starts losing body pieces and he like starts collecting them in jars and stuff and like keeping them in his bathroom, it's just like yeah. trying to basically trying to preserve what was, uh, Seth Brundle before yeah. he became Brundle fly. And I'm like, yeah. And then you see the, the penis had just fallen off and like was in a jar and it's just like, Oh, Oh God. Mm, all of these things and then your peanut that dude it's, <laughs> it's time to just call it quits <laughs> right no i you know what's funny is that you that you notice that stuff merely being a male um you identified with that a little bit more than i did uh but i what always stands out to me always is when he gets blended with the machine and he falls out of the machine and he's like this fucking horrible ghost looking thing and yeah. she pauses about shooting him in the head. And the first time I saw this movie, I was like, bitch, you shoot him in the fucking head. What are you doing? Like, Have some mercy. <laughs> like, oh my God, right? And and it, I think it's awesome how it ends right there. And that's it. Yeah. Um, This movie definitely, you know, we talked about in that article, it wasn't, you know, the starting of body horror by any stance, but I feel like this movie turned it up a notch. Yeah. Right? Like, this is, I think, where a lot of the gross out parts of body horror became, like, embedded in people's head. with this Because this was a mainstream film, for one. Yes, it was. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And so this, like, hit a much larger audience than stuff that we've watched before, like Street Trash, that only horror fans would watch. Yes. Like, 
Totally. So yeah, this one, and I think it even like think there was even uh, Oscars nom- got Oscar nominated or like yeah. had some type of awards for it. Well, this was seen as science fictiony, right? It yeah. wasn't horror; it was science fiction, right? So it, you know, it's a nice little label that you can throw on something. But let's be very clear here: this is body horror at its finest. Yeah. Um, but body horror always doesn't have to be extreme. Sometimes it can be subtle, which yes. we're going to talk about in our next film. Yeah, so uh, the next film on our list is The Skin I Live In, released September 2nd, 2011. Ever since his beloved wife was horribly burned in an auto accident, Dr. Robert Ledger, a skilled plastic surgeon, has tried to develop a new skin that could save the lives of burn victims. Finally, after 12 years, Ledger has created a skin that guards the body but is still sensitive to touch. With the aid of his faithful housekeeper, Ledgar tests his creation on Vera, who is held prisoner against her will in the doctor's mansion. Um, So, yeah, the reason I chose this film for the list was because, you know, most people, when they think body horror, think like the grotesque, the oozy, pussy stuff, bodies failing them, falling apart. Sometimes body horror comes in a different package, and that is having something done to you without your consent. Sometimes Antonio way. Banderas is better. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes Antonio is better. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Scott, I couldn't resist. Um, yeah, you're right. You're right. Sometimes body horror is about things happening to you that you don't consent to, like a sex change, yeah. um, for example. <laughs> um, this movie has a lot of layers to it. The body horror piece is not as important as the other topics that are had in it. Um, It's very much a layered film that you really have to sign up for and be in it for the long haul. It's a two hour runtime. So I just want to warn people going into it where this fly kind of gets into shit right away. This takes its time um, for you to establish what's going on. But you do see, and I'm just going to skip to the body horror piece, the forced mental and physical transformation of a man to a woman. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty intense. Yeah. Like, cause like, like it says in the synopsis, he's a plastic surgeon. So he has the ability to do all these things. Plus he has friends that are helping him that uh, they don't know why they're helping him. Like they don't realize the whole extent of what's happening here. Mm. Like, but yeah, like he, it's basically a revenge film and he's getting his revenge and he even takes this revenge to a much further extreme by like, yeah, like just completely transforming this person into someone they are not forcefully. Yeah. Um, and he, you know, develops a vagina on this individual and there's a part where this individual is raped and it's very painful for this individual mm-hmm. um, because if you are born uh, with a vagina, your vagina is going to have obviously natural muscles in it and other such things. If you are uh, have surgery to create a vagina, then you have to strengthen it and, and naturally um, expand those muscles. Like that's just, I'm sure people who are transgendered, it, it must be very challenging. It must be very painful to go through and, and have that done. Uh, unfortunately, the person in this movie did not have it done consensually. So They weren't choosing to have it done. So when, you know, obviously sexual assault is painful enough in the first place, but to be sexually assaulted with a vagina that you did not want in the first place, and that probably hasn't been stretched out enough to not be painful. Yeah, I didn't even think about that part. Yes, right? Must have been very, very hard. And you see the pain on the actresses. It. The, even though we're talking about a, a gentleman that was that had a forced sex change to uh, to be female or assigned as a female gender, you know we have two people that play this character. There is a yeah. male that plays him, at, and then a female who plays her. And the female does a very good job of selling the pain that she is in. Yes, she does. Um, and you know the she's obviously had breast implants done. Uh, it's it's a very dark film and the not just like (laughs) it's not just the physical stuff it's it's the walking it's the interest it's the flexibility constantly doing flexibility stuff so she can be flexible like a woman it's this forced transition that goes on for like 12 years 
Yeah. Like it's a long drawn out torturous thing that is done to this person is body horror over a long period of time and it's mental horror and the ending is very much you understand exactly what happens and it's very emotional this is this is not a movie to go into lightly i'll put it that way this is very much an emotional film yeah, damn, you have like pretty much hit all the notes I was going to talk about. Sorry, there, right? well, but, yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't mean to like cut you off. I hope I. Oh, you didn't cut me just, off. That's no, just like, what I just, got from it. Yeah, I was going to say you just nailed it because it, yeah, like just uh, watching this as a male mm-hmm. and just trying to imagine being having this surgery forcefully done upon you and to be stuck in the house with the person that is doing this to you, locked in this room for like you said 12 years years like this is years of torture yeah like you're slowly yeah. just and like all you have to do is well this is my body now so i gotta do this stuff to make it work mm-hmm. and just and after a while like you even start to think that she ends up uh just kind of accepting her fate. yeah you think that she embraces it and actually does fall in love with antonio banderas now Antonio Banderas is a very sexy man. He is not a sexy man in this movie. He is no. a psychopath. He's, he's creepy um, in this. Right? But like it's, I, I do really appreciate his ability to perform in this film. Um, I felt the same way about Pierce Broadson earlier this year in False Positive. Yes. I felt that those are two people that don't come across as dicks, generally speaking, and they played creepy pieces of shit in both films really really well yeah. and I think that speaks to their acting abilities right like when you're able to pull Troy that and you know why this person gets into this situation what he did as a male wasn't right either right. uh did some you know sexually assaulted somebody so there's a reason why all this happens but yeah it's a real long drawn out body horror it's like a slow scratching of the skin for body horror like it's a little scratch so it doesn't seem that bad and then it's another scratch and another scratch and before you know it your skin's all cut up and you're like how the fuck did i get in so much pain that's like watching this movie and being like oh my god oh my god oh my god (laughs) it goes on and on and you figure out more and more um so very good subtle use of body horror i'm glad you brought it to the to the table scott yeah, this one was, like I said, I wanted to bring something that most people probably wouldn't even think of when they think body horror. And mm-hmm. I and I had, I couldn't, all, all I remember was like the forced sex change and all that stuff. I remember that happening. I didn't remember how drawn out it was because the mm. only time I seen this was in the theater back when it was released, like as a special screening. And that was the only time I'd ever watched it. So that was like, what, 2011? So yeah, that's yeah. 10 years ago. And like that shows at least that this movie stuck with me enough to leave that image in my head of what happens. I just, uh, I just did not remember that it was like that drawn out and like all the torturous stuff that that person had to go through. So like, yeah. 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 And you know, that's not the only film that we saw that was drawn out and torturous person that suffered for the entire film. It sounds like our next film. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. You are just nailing these segues today. (laughs) Well, you know what? They're set up perfectly in all fairness. (laughs) That is true. I'm, I'm giving you an easy layup. (laughs) Oh man. Yeah, for sure. We're like Uh, Le Bon Bon and you're like Steph Curry. I'm Larry Bird. No, no. Oh, Larry Bird. We'll go with Larry Bird. That works too. (laughs) Uh, But the third film in what we're our body horror segment, you know, we're taking another trip down Cronenberg Lane, except not David. We are talking Brandon Cronenberg's very Mm -hmm. first film antiviral released october 12th 2012 sid tries to unravel the mystery surrounding hannah's death before a virus kills him well that was a very simple plot synopsis Mm -hmm. um but yeah this is uh one that i wanted to bring to the table because once again this is uh a more realistic look at a disease ravaging ravaging a body Mm -hmm. in a very fucked up dystopian future um, I almost wanted to bring this to our table if we ever did an obsession episode because this mm. just shows the obsession that fans get for celebrities to the point where they would inject themselves with a certain virus that the celebrity has just to feel a more connected thing with that celebrity. And so there's a company that just kind of takes over and uh, takes advantage of that. And this guy is also obsessed. He's a, one of the employees and he is also obsessed with uh, the celebrity Hannah. And he goes and draws her blood because he's basically like one of the spokesmen for that sh- place. And he takes a little vial for himself to inject into his own body, 
little did he know that this was like a bioweapon disease that was used to try to kill her and he now has it in his body and it is like slowly destroying him from the inside out and while he is dealing with this he is having obsessed fans who want this trying to hunt him down to sell the disease for themselves as well to other fans yeah, I don't think this movie could have been made post-COVID. I'm going to put that out no, there. No, um, no, 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 no. I think this was definitely a pre-COVID concept. And I think you're describing it a perfectly. That's exactly what happens in this film. And the sickness gets worse as it goes through. And yet again, with David Cronenberg, similar to Brandon, or Brandon similar to his dad, he starts right off with the action. Like yeah. automatically, we're at the clinic. We're watching this guy upsell people on these diseases and that that's his job and then we see that he is sick himself and he the actor is is fucking awesome yeah i'm trying to look i can't remember his name but he was in get out and a couple other movies and he is such an amazing actor and this movie really as you said scott showcases how far people will go for celebrity status but also shows the slow decline of this sickness and how all these people want to market this drug or this disease to others. And then there's even a part where, a, like, I forget how it basically, I guess they've kind of put together that the disease got leaked and it's more dangerous and the company's trying to backpedal on everything. Yeah. Right. And that's, you know, more towards the end. But this is very much a TIFF film, in my opinion. It's a very slow burn, but it's a very creepy, subtle decline of illness and watching people get sicker and sicker and sicker and taking people's blood and invec- and like really close up shots of needles and shit that make you uncomfortable. And unlike the skin I live in, there's nothing really overly graphic. Like there is obviously seeing people sick and blood and stuff like that. There's some graphic scenes, but I found that it was just knowing that these people are sick and watching them decline was the worst part of the body horror. Yeah, because this it was, was like more a, real a war life. was being yes, a war was being raged inside of them, yes. and you were kind of just the viewer watching it go down, and it's just really subtle and creepy. Yeah, because this 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 one makes me uncomfortable just because it's a look at what it really looks like to be sick. Yes. It's very, very realistic. And like you said, yeah, this could not be made post COVID. No, this would hit too many, (laughs) too many nerves. No, Um, but yeah, the actor uh, is Caleb Landry, Caleb Landry Jones. Nice. I'm glad you figured that out. Amazing actor. He's amazing. Amazing. Carries his fucking film. Uh, And, And he just like portrays like looking sick, like the whole time too. Like you can just tell like he's flushed. Like it, just the way his face, like mm-hmm. the way he's like, just not really even like showing much emotion. Like he's just drained. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. but yeah, this is just one of those films that I watched him going, oh yeah, this is definitely body horror. And it's more just in a realistic, not gross you out kind of way. Just more like unsettling just because yeah, you are watching the decay of a human body. And, and the idea of disease selling and then, yeah. you know, you're selling the afterlife. And even then he's still obsessed with this chick in the, in the new way that they sell her to make money. And it really does play to like, you know, what he's talking about is money's in disease, right? There's, there's, there's a message here that, yeah. <laughs> you know, we get rich off of people getting sick and there's a lot of debate behind you know, where does money exactly go for cancer research and other such things that Scott and I will not get back and get into in this podcast. But (laughs) that was definitely a political message that Brandon was trying to communicate through this film. Um, And I really appreciate it. And I just think that this is subtle horror done right. It's not going to be for everybody because, you know, you're not getting like over the top stuff that you're getting at the fly, but you are getting a very, very sharp look at someone's decline and if you liked possessor which was his uh movie from last year i think you'll enjoy antiviral like if you're a fan of his i think you'll like both of these films um they just have a subtle way that they move about them they're not over the top they're very subtle in their filming they're very subtle in their acting but it's it's a good flow yeah and one thing uh i just gotta say it but like the way this film is shot too um oh man it's it's very antiseptic Yes. Like it's very just clean and white and yes. everything compared sterile, to the disease. Yeah, yeah sterile. Like there Yes. Yes. Anyway, yeah, it's like compared to the diseased bodies, everything else around them looks like just clean and white and clean, like just 
healthy and unlike the bodies. Unlike Scott and I. So if any of our fans want celiac <laughs> disease, I have that. And Scott has a bad back and high blood pressures. So. I'll say I can, I can give you some good old heart disease with some blood pressure. <laughs> you know, we're, we're where it's at for, uh, for yep. celiac disease is the best. Yes. Don't like eating gluten. Want to overpay for bread every place you go to get gross tasting gluten-free bread. Celiac disease may be for you. Want to spend um, time looking over the menu, making sure you can even eat here. <laughs> Celiacs for you. <laughs> it's true. Scott knows. I'll be like, all right, Scott, we go to this restaurant because I can order at least three things there. So it's fine. Like, it's true. It's hashtag my life. Yeah. Um, you know, my Canadian life, which goes to a Canadian horror film. <laughs> you are on a roll. All right. So why don't you bring in our last film? Well, I mean, technically, the last film was also Canadian, too. So a lot yeah, of Canadian. Yeah, but this one's, this one's. <laughs> yes. Like over the top, yeah. Indiana. So all right. So the movie we are referring to is Tusk, released September nineteenth, two thousand and fourteen. A U.S. podcaster ventures into the Canadian wilderness to interview an old man who has an extraordinary past, <laughs> and the American learns the man has a dark, dark secret involving a walrus. <laughs> This movie's fucking hilarious. I don't know why I thought this movie would be uncomfortable. It totally wasn't. Um, I thought this movie, honestly, this has become one of my favorite films. I think it's so funny. <laughs> oh my God, this fucking movie. <laughs> I, uh, like, I never thought it would be a situation where Scott would be like, nah, it was okay. And I'm like, what are you fucking talking about? <laughs> a boot? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, well... I think it's because I watched it before you and I'm sitting here going, oh, is this going to offend Heather? <laughs> oh, no, I thought it was fucking hilarious. And you know what? I'm going to stay away from the Canadiana stuff, but the border security, <laughs> the fucking comment that Justin Long makes about hockey and the conversation with the border guard is fucking hilarious. Like, it's it's really funny. So here's, <laughs> here's I'll try to get to the body horror. First of all, I want to acknowledge that they made Justin Long such an asshole that you didn't give a fuck what happened to him. In this <laughs> yes. Like, that's what I thought I was going to be upset about. Like, I thought I was going to feel sorry for Justin Long. I did not feel sorry for Justin Long because Justin Long was a dick. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and, you know, the premise of him going there to basically make fun of a kid who plays with a samurai sword who kills himself, sadly. Um, that's kind of the sad part of it. And then he goes to this fucking frontier man. Like this was like every stereotypical frontier, frontier Canadian, or you could argue American dude too that lives up in Alaska. Like, oh yeah. Cool. And <laughs> telling these fucking ridiculous stories that were actually quite good. The dialogue between um, Michael Parks and Justin Long was fucking phenomenal. Yes. Like two very good actors, but <laughs> when he just, Justin Long and he cuts off his legs. That's the story of the body horror, right? Is that he's going to turn this kid into a fucking walrus. And and why is he going to do that? Because his friend, the walrus, died because he killed him for food. <laughs> oh, dumb, crack. but it's cracked me up. <laughs> <laughs> dumb Canadian. Like, that is a dumb fisherman fucking Canadian story <laughs> that you would hear somebody from Newfoundland be like, I had a mighty ball and I was out there in the boat and I was coming in and then there was a walrus and I was like, oh my God, I got to do something about this walrus. Like, you don't know anyone <laughs> from Newfoundland. And that's why this is a movie that Kevin Smith made where every Canadian, in my opinion, would not be offended by the stereotypes here because they're so fucking over the top. It's funny. Like he covers in enough stuff that you're like, that's fucking funny because there's people like that. That's fucking funny because there's people like that. And I'll make one uh, last Canadian reference. So there's a part where they start, they keep talking about a hockey player named Gumshoe. <laughs> For those who don't, you know, follow hockey and don't live in Canada, we bring up hockey players all the time. Like you could be in a regular conversation. It's like NFL for the United States, like Tom Brady, right. like fucking Patrick Mahone and stuff like that. Right. So you could be talking to another Canadian <laughs> And George and I always joke, right? Austin Matthews, Austin Matthews, hell of a player, hell of a player, future Hall of Flamer. Oh, Mitch Murder, Mitch Murder, hell of a player, heck of a player. They just got to get their D on. Their D on, they got to get better. And they got to score more and they got to drive more to the net and they'll be fine. Like that is how fucking Canadians <laughs> talk. So this guy going off about 
gumshoe was fucking amazing um but back to the body horror that's it for the canadian piece but when he saws off his legs and like justin long looks down and he's missing his fucking leg and the guy's trying to tell him it's because of brown recruit spider yeah. <laughs> <It's> funny <laughs> he's like well where's the doctor oh the doctor left <laughs> <laughs> the doctor makes his round to the houses like no, I don't have a phone. <laughs> and he's such, and and I got to give Kevin Smith credit because this would have been a lot more stressful, but we found out that Justin Lons is bully who bullies people. And then he's cheating on his girlfriend, like excessively treats her like crap. And when proudly saying it to his best friend. Oh yeah. Like completely is a complete douchebag. Right. So like, it's, it's very, <laughs> it's, it's really well done. But I guess like the ultimate part of this is when he finally puts him in the walrus costume. yelling like he's screaming and he's like no you must learn to act like a walrus well i was gonna say because yeah he wasn't put in a walrus costume he was turned into a walrus is what i thought he said no he said i have a walrus costume i'm gonna sew you into it so he used his yeah it was a costume he sewed him into see i thought like he literally changed him into a walrus no no that was a costume he sewed him into oh wow okay that became a walrus but it was a costume because that's why he had all that's why when justin long (laughs) gets pulled to the bottom of the pool and he sees the other walrus costume and the body that was inside it, the bones. That's why the okay. costume hasn't disintegrated and the person has. And all you can see is the skeleton. Oh, okay. That's making more sense now because I was going to say, yeah, I was really lacking in the body horror part where you didn't really even see the transformation no, into you, the walrus. Did that... you see the part where he's laying on the table and he has the costume and he's wrapping him up in it? I don't, I must have missed that somehow. Oh, it's easy to miss. It's not that long in all fairness. Like, so what happens? He takes off, I'm like splitting the movie to you. <laughs> <laughs> his legs. and like really you don't see the transition like you see the leg removal and you hear this guy talking to him like how you're going to become a walrus like it was like a comical version of in the skin i live in where that was very serious and talking about a forced sex change this is just a piece of shit that's being put into a walrus costume um and he says you're going to learn to act like a walrus and you're going to become a walrus and he puts him in the costume and he sews him up and he puts him in that like makeshift like water area (laughs) Justin Long just keeps screaming the entire time and there's a part where he gives him the fish and he's not going to eat the fish but then he decides to eat the fish because it's the only food he has you know what I'm talking about right yeah yeah that part I know like yeah like (laughs) he had his tongue removed and everything so he couldn't actually speak right so he's just like (laughs) screaming and flopping about and slamming his uh (laughs) his flippers right yeah and the part that I found really fucking funny is there's a part where Michael Parks is in the water with him and he's holding on to his flippers and he's like you shall worm to swim and you watch Justin fit Justin Long's eyes they're like rolling around like he's like what the fuck is wrong with this guy oh my god like well, I that- honestly thought this movie was gonna be upsetting it was it was just funny <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, because, yeah, I, I thought it was going to be much darker. And like I said, I so thought he was actually getting turned into a walrus. So this makes it even more cornier. It's, it was just that it, a big costume. Yeah, that it was he, just a big costume. When he oh pulls him on a chain, he's like, you know, you must learn how to swim. And he pulls him into the water. He pulls him all the way down to the bottom. And that's when he sees. Yeah, I was like, because I remember him right? seeing the body down there, but I didn't. Yeah. like. That's why the costume is still in cap. Yeah, but I the, didn't even think about that. Right? The bones have. Anyway, because he's tried to do it before. And then, and then the part where they fight. So Justin Long's like sleeping. And then it's like, we shall fight like walruses. Like this movie is body horror. Like it definitely has parts that are dark. When he drugs him, he takes off his leg. He's wrapping him in the walrus costume. And definitely being forced to be in a walrus costume. And if Justin Long had been a likable person, I think you would have felt bad for him because he's such a douchebag. And like, he finally like fights back against this dude and then kills him. And his 
friend and you know girlfriend show up and he they have to take him to a sanctuary and you do feel sad for him that one tear falls down his face at the end when she tells him that she loves him um yeah but at the same time he's only sewn into the casting you <laughs> think they would have been able to get but, some help to get that but, surgically removed but somehow he's, he's had his tongue removed he's had his legs removed he's been conditioned that he's a walrus you know, maybe maybe it was just an easier life, Scott. Honestly, I thought this movie was fucking hilarious. Like, and I never thought a day would come that I would like something this silly. And Scott is like, what the fuck is this shit? But it's happened on Friday Nightmares. <laughs> oh. I just thought it was like, and I'm not even going into how much I enjoyed Johnny Depp's version of a Quebecer. Like... <laughs> that in itself was like to the americans don't you guys have guns don't you all have guns like it's just there's some funny shit the jokes about degrassi all i can say is kevin smith you may not do body horror well but you do canadian horror well. <laughs> and canadian satire um but i did appreciate the wall walrus costume and i enjoyed justin long's portrayal of the of the walrus i thought it was that'd be, that'd be scary scott imagine having your legs cut off and put in a suit <laughs> it would be and no tongue you can't talk and the madman no screaming at you to be a walrus right and then come in and the madman shows up in the tank with you with fucking teeth and <laughs> tells you you're gonna have a duel like, it's, like what it's the fuck shit. is going on <laughs> <laughs> so like what were your takes on this i know you thought it was silly obviously i loved it but any comments you want to make about the body um, before we put this to bed and i stop laughing well you pretty much put one thing to bed and that was the whole yeah i wish they would have actually shown him like slowly transitioning into a walrus <laughs> but that explains <laughs> it because he wasn't actually transitioning he was just rolled into a suit <laughs> um um, but yeah, I did, uh, when he was in the suit, like I did just kind of chuckle the fact, like when he's getting frustrated, and angry, all I could do is just kind of flop around right. and like, rah, rah. <laughs> <That's ridiculous. laughs> and then, yeah, I did chuckle with the walrus battle at the end. We got to fight to the death. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, it's ridiculous. It so, was so dumb. Oh my God. <laughs> it's so funny. Oh, but oh, like, fuck. yeah, I so watch this going, oh. Heather is going to be like, what the fuck with all these Canadian references? Like, like so. But Heather just, loved it. Yeah. Heather thought, loved it. It's become one of Heather. It might be on Heather's 50th top horror films. <laughs> and she oh, liked man. It so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It was so fucking funny. Yeah. Anyway. This is, I completely pegged this movie wrong for you. I so I was like, you know, like, oh, God, she's going to roll her eyes at this one so bad. <laughs> I just feel like Kevin Smith did it in a way that he knew it was a satire and he was being silly. Like, I don't think he actually, here's the thing, the stereotypes he came out with, and I don't mean this as an offensive thing here, aren't low-hanging American fruit that they think about Canadians. This isn't Canadian bacon, which was really a low-hanging stereotype. This was like a step up from that. Right. That you, if you've actually been to Canada and met with someone from the West or met with someone from the East or <laughs> met with a true Quebecer or listen to like the way people talk about hockey. It was, or the grassy high or how people talk about Americans. Like it was, it was funny. Like it took that stuff and it kind of supersized it and put it on steroids and it was entertaining. But honestly, the scene that makes me laugh is when the dude, and I've gone over it already, is in that pool with Justin Long and he's driving him around and he's saying stuff and Justin Long just keeps rolling his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> that's subtle acting without having to do much um but definitely not one of our darker um body horror films <laughs> nope. definitely um a very fluffy one to end off our our body horror discussion on <laughs> yeah i had no idea it was gonna be that like over the top silly like <laughs> i figured it would be a little bit but i thought it would be a little more darker than it actually was no it wasn't dark it was not dark it was not an uncomfortable film no wonder when no. people were like i was like i'm scared to watch tusk they're like you'll be fine <laughs> It's not what you think it is, Heather. Um, but anyway, for out of our dark, uh, out of the dark, out, out of, of our dark, our, out of out our, our dark. dark. Is that a new sexual position? Out yes. of our dark. <laughs> it's what I'm gonna do to you when I put you in a walrus costume when you come up here. <laughs> <laughs> Take you to the Toronto Zoo and wish you the best. Um, anyway. <laughs> out of the dark we're we're gonna just be giving a shout out to uh some 2021 must watch movies that we think if you haven't had a chance to check them out yet you should um 
and no particular order of the ones that you know we like unless god has an order i just listed no. mine in terms of you know what came up first on my letterbox it was easier for me to connect to so the first one is censor uh this is an 84 minute runtime it's a short synopsis about a censorship in the 80s in Britain. Uh, and it follows one main character. It's quite good, very well acted, excellent, excellent film. Uh, it has a 3.3 rating on Letterboxd. You can find it on iTunes, Google, Microsoft Store, Cineplex, and YouTube. Uh, the next one is The Sound of Violence, uh, definitely a sleeper hit, I think. Uh, not as high yeah. of a rating, 2.7. Uh, not everyone liked it as Scott and I. I'm looking at you, Tim Davis. Uh, but that's okay. That's okay. I really enjoyed this one quite a bit. Uh, it's available on iTunes, Google, Vudu, Microsoft uh, Store, and YouTube. Sorry, iTunes, Google, Vudu, Microsoft Store, and YouTube. Another take on body horror, actually. Yes. Um, very, very interesting. Next one is Benny Loves You. A lot Benny of people. Cut on me. Cut on me. Uh, fucking one of the best horror comedies that have come out this year. Oh, it's so. The way I always describe this movie is it's adorably demented. It is so funny. It is available on Amazon, Google Play, uh, Voodoo, and Showtime Amazon. Please check it out if you haven't had a chance to. A lower budget sleeper hit. Uh, If you enjoyed Come Play last year, you will like this film. It is called The Gin, and it is available on iTunes, Voodoo, Google Play, uh, IFC, Amazon Channel, and YouTube. And finally, The Vigil, which we've already talked about earlier. Um, This is a great horror film from the Jewish community perspective of what happens when we die. 88 minute runtime. It is available on iTunes, Hula, um, Hulu, sorry, Hulu, (laughs) not Hula, Hulu, Google Play, Vudu, and DirecTV. So Scotty, what are yours? All right. So yeah, these are ones that Kind of like what you were doing too. I picked five that I just don't see being talked about a lot that I think should be contenders for end of year lists or at least should be watched. Um, So one of the first ones I picked was Fear of Rain, um, mainly because the story is not uh, unique because it's a typical story like Rear Window, Disturbia, stuff like um, Fright Night, that type of storyline. But what it does is it covers schizophrenia in like such a realistic way of someone that is dealing with it and how they're coping with it and like the way they cope with it and just like the plays on like what she what is she seeing is it real or is it just in her head and it's it leaves it up to the uh leaves a good mystery like leading up to this entire story and i found the performances all were really well done um the other one was, uh, I'm trying to get to my letterbox for this. Sorry. That's okay. You should have been more prepared, Scott. I was, and I backed out. And then now it's closed off. There it is. Uh, so, yeah. The next one is We Are the Missing, uh, which is basically about uh, one morning when Riley should be at class. Her mother, Angie, hears a cell phone ringing from her bedroom, soon to discover Riley left her phone behind. She answers what is Riley's best friend Mackenzie's third attempt to reach someone, and basically Riley has just gone missing with a couple of others and it's basically a lower budget what was the name of the movie uh like like mongo yeah like mongo yeah uh but yeah it's a lower budget version of this very well done done in the mockumentary style very well acted this was a very early watch for me but it's still like it still has stuck with me Mm -hmm. um Another one, I brought it up earlier in our recently watched list, and that is uh, Ankle Biters, or also known as Cherry Pickers. I brought this one because obviously it's not available anywhere right now, but man, did this movie just exceed my expectations and just was way darker than I had expected it to and just very well done. Um, And I'm sorry, uh, Fear of Rain can be watched on Hulu. Uh, We Are the Missing, still not available, actually. Oh, man, I hope it drops this year. Yeah, I'm kind of shocked on that one. Uh, Ankle Biters, still not available yet. Uh, But the next one is My Heart Can't Beat Unless You Tell It To, which I found this to just be a very unique take on a horror trope or a horror subgenre that has been done thousands and thousands and thousands of times over. And it's uh, making people into walruses. Yes. (laughs) With with, uh, shouting Quebec Quebec lines at you. Yeah. And yelling hockey all the time. Yes. <laughs> hockey players' names randomly. And saying sorry in the boot. 
Oh man. <laughs> but uh yeah, this is just a very well paced, well acted uh horror drama that covers a certain type of horror subgenre. Probably one of the one of my favorites of this year. Uh this one is available on iTunes, Google Play, Vudu, Amazon, and YouTube. Ooh, yeah. And then one of my very surprise hits of the year is mm-hmm. we need to do something. Um may possibly be really high in my top 10 just saying um it's gonna beat out lamb yes this is my number 0.5 lamb is number one this is (laughs) (laughs) 0.5 this is how i'm gonna squeeze in 20 movies in my top 10 (laughs) be like point uh we're going with a uh, 10, 9.5, 9. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. The longest show ever. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we need to do something as an isolation horror film. People, uh, family stuck in a bathroom during a horrific storm. Uh, things happen that are very unexpected. Um, family degenerates and like basically is at each other's throats. Really creepy shit happens. Very low budget. All shot within one room. Shot during lockdown. Shot in Michigan. Very well acted. Gory. Creepy as fuck. Just, very well acted film. Very yeah, well this acted. was one of my like I I was just completely blown away by it. Fucking love this movie. Tim Davis, you're wrong. <laughs> We're- we're breaking up you're so wrong but you're so right (laughs) you're so right for my body Mm, yes tim tim you have given me a scott crawford (laughs) oh my and for more on that please listen to horror for dummies (laughs) to understand what he's talking about uh it's a great podcast out of australia uh if you guys want to check those, those awesome guys you can find them on any podcast service that you that you listen to um and for movies that we're looking forward to well there's two (laughs) antlers and what's the other one scott oh last night in soho i do have one i don't know if you've seen the trailer for it what it's called black friday and it's a zombie movie about zombies that attack a retail store on black friday bruce campbell bruce campbell is the manager of the store fucking son of a bitch i'm in (laughs) right (laughs) that looks amazing (laughs) that sounds like a lot of fun yeah. Um, so yeah, so we're going to do this again with our next November episode. We're going to give out some shout outs to must watch films. Um, maybe Scotty will be kind enough to just copy and paste them in our notes so you can see yeah. them. Uh, if maybe. you know, you want to check them out, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. I'm thinking more for Dave C. Um, cause Dave C has asked us to find a way to make sure that we can make it clear and be communicated, but she's right. It'd probably be easier for people to locate it. Uh, so yes, we will do this again in November and then we're going to do something a little bit different in December. And then we have some new stuff coming up, uh, for January. We're going to be doing a very special episode for our 50th and 51st episode. Uh, this should be a lot of fun. Scott just moved his eyebrows up. It's very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> He's overwhelmed at how exciting it's going to be. I mean, my nipples are erect right now. Absolutely. Like I there's cut glass. There's 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 what we're going to do on episode 50 and 51. And then there's everything else in life. All I got to uh, say is for episode 50 and 51, everybody bring your lube. <laughs> Scott, I love it. That's really funny. <laughs> um, so as always, thank you for tuning in. If you haven't already subscribed to Legion Podcast, and what are you, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? <laughs> what are you uh, waiting for? <laughs> Please subscribe down, subscribe to Legion Podcast and listen to all our awesome Legion friends in their podcast episodes. Also, if you're not a Patreon, then Scott. What what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? <laughs> Please join Patreon today for $3 a month. You get tons of goodies. You get our top five show. You get a whole bunch of other stuff. You get Bo. Who doesn't want more of Bo? Honestly, mm. Bo all day, all night. Yeah, That's why you that sign Bo. up for Legion Patreon. So thank you again for joining us. We will see you next time. Scotty, do you have anything to say to the people? Yes. Um, until next time, uh, be sure not to talk to some weirdo way up north in the Canadian <laughs> outback, um, especially if he starts talking about walruses. <laughs> Just never know. But if you happen to do that, 
please message your friend, say, find a Quebecer investigator and just hope for the best. Until next time, <laughs> or, 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 unpleasant dreams. I had a body hole and I caught the salmon and it was so big in the cod. <laughs> Good night, guys. See ya. Bye. Bye.